make sure we've chosen the right line to be able to get into to get through as quickly as possible. Well, we want to know what that, uh, uh, what, uh, that next vehicle is going to be, how long is it going to take. In fact, uh, what we do, uh, uh, I refer to as the transit dance, uh, as you come up to a bus stop or a light rail station, um, you come up, uh, you look down the track or the road to see if the bus is coming, you look at your watch, you pace back and forth four or five times, and then you start the process again. You look down the road, look, watch, pace back and forth. In fact, in London, um, that first introduced this type of concept, um, they did before and after uh, studies and uh, analyses. Um, people uh, uh, believe, after they have real-time information, uh, that the uh, bus came more frequently, that it was more reliable, um, and that it was a, a higher quality of service. None of which were true, uh, <laughs> but it was that sense of knowledge. It allowed people to be able to sit down and relax and read, go get a cup of coffee, pick up a newspaper, uh, but to know when things were. Um, and that ability to be able to do it uh, has been very important. Um, we also have provided, and this is one of the, I think, really fun things, we've opened up our data, our transit data, uh, really as open source. Uh, um, one of the uh, first, in fact, the first effort by Google to do uh, transit uh, mapping, to be able to provide for both how to be able to uh, get to the transit station and then to be able to uh, access that transit was developed in Portland, Oregon, using our data. Um, it has now been expanded to many cities in North America and uh, internationally as well. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it's exciting to be able to see that. But we also use that open data to provide uh, uh, people with uh, uh, ways to be able to develop their own applications. Uh, uh, a, a friend, uh, one of our community organizers, had uh, entered on his uh, BlackBerry the ability to pick up uh, one of, uh, uh, or actually two bus routes that he could get home on, or the uh, streetcar. And what it did, uh, he programmed it so he could see that uh, the next uh, uh, way home, three minutes away, or whatever the time was, was by bus number 17, or uh, maybe the next one was uh, bus 15, or the streetcar. Well, I said, hold it, I said to our people, can't we find ways to tap that uh, creativity? Why do we have to develop all those applications? We now have um, nearly 40 applications that have been developed by our riders that uh, are on our website. We make sure they work and there's support and a couple of things, but we don't try to edit uh, them in any way. But there are about 40 applications that people have developed uh, and make available to other users of the system. One of my favorite is uh, called Napster uh, by, the, by the author, uh, by the creator of it. Um, what it does is, it, uh, if you're riding the bus and uh, want to make sure you, uh, in case you might fall asleep, that it'll wake you before you get to your bus stop. <laughs> Napster. Uh, well, I'm going to do three charts here. And this is, these are a little bit busy, so um, I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in uh, but just to, for you to be oriented toward it, um, the listing uh, are uh, um, really uh, cities that uh, have transit systems that are comparable to us, really uh, below the top seven uh, systems in the United States. These are the next tier, and we're a part of that. They are a rate from left in lowest population to right highest population. Um, and what you see on this first chart is just annual ridership by service area. It does total amount of ridership. And, and although we are not certainly number one, um, you can see that in the Portland region, uh, relatively lower in on the population, um, that we are surpassed by um, Seattle, Baltimore, um, and, uh, and just about tied, uh, or pardon me, Seattle, but Baltimore, and Miami, and tied really with Houston uh, uh, in terms of the largest. Um, but the, maybe the, the story is a bit more important when you start looking at the comparables, and that really is on a per capita basis. Here's annual boardings per resident. And what you really see in the Portland region is that we have really upped that number um, on a per capita basis. Probably the, the thing that really uh, equalizes that uh, analysis. And the next chart tells you one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the reasons why. Here is weekend ridership. And you can see that we just out, uh, outstrip most other areas. We provide lots of service on weekends. But the more important message in this is that by using uh, uh, that service on the weekends, it isn't just about that work trip, not just getting to and from work. It has become a part of the lifestyle of people um, in the region. 
Um, it really is used for that shopping trip, going to the zoo, uh, going to a Blazer game, our, our NBA team, or a series of other things. Well, what's been the result? Uh, of that. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we see a, a, a substantial difference. Um, this on the top bar is really our TriMet ridership um, over the past decade. By the way, these are a little bit old uh, on the data because um, the National Transit Database, uh, administered by the federal government, uh, lags. And to be able to get actually comparable data, um, we use that data even though our own data is a lot more recent. But the trends are, are continuing. Here you see private tri ridership, our uh, public transit ridership, going, growing dramatically. The service has increased some during that period, but not as much. Now, there's another story in this, and that is that we're also filling empty seats. That is, this is a measure also of efficiency. That is, service hours have increased, um, but not as fast as ridership. We are getting more and more people um, on the system. Most significantly, however, if you look against population, and particularly vehicle miles traveled, you are seeing that we are one of the only, we in New York City, uh, until this most rec recent uh, catastrophic economic downturn, we uh, in New York City were the only two places that had our um, population um, growing faster than our car use. Um, and if, if we're going to be addressing some of the, the uh, global uh, climate change issues, uh, obviously that is very, very important. Um, we also, by the way, recognized in the, uh, in the Portland region that uh, it's not just one service. Although a lot of focus gets on trams, you know, for us, light rail and streetcar, and I may come back to some of those here in a few minutes. Uh, but about 55% of our riders are on our bus system, about 45% on, um, on our rail. Um, and it is absolutely key that that uh, is there. We also operate service for um, lots of hours. We actually are shut down uh, only about two hours a day. That is, our last train or bus pulls into the yard at about 2 a.m. Uh, first one pulls out at just before 4 a.m. Uh, it doesn't leave much time for our maintenance away people to do the maintenance uh, on the uh, on the overhead rail uh, alignment or to be able to work on uh, buses, uh, but it is an important part of uh, the service within communities. Well, what uh, we find, and this is the issue around uh, transit-oriented development, uh, that sustainable transportation really is a key. We have seen uh, since 1980, and we use that date because it's really when it was clear that we were going to build our first light rail alignment. It opened in 1986. But people could count on it. Investors could count on it. We've had uh, uh, about $8 billion invested within...